Good Monday morning. Hola, hola. Yo soy Max Cisneros. I am the Latinx program curator for the New Haven Pride Center. And I'm glad that you could join us today for Black Caribbean Queer Migration. Like I mentioned, my name is Max Cisneros. I use him, they pronouns. And uh, I am a Latinx uh, program curator for the New Haven Pride Center. And I'm broadcasting live from Norwalk and to the world. Norwalk and New Haven sit on the traditional lands of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticote, Pagasot, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac peoples. Wherever occupied, whatever occupied lands on which you settle your life, please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the native people whose lands on which we all occupy and the history of the places we know and have come to love. To find out more about native lands, please take a moment to visit the website native-land.ca. That's native-land.ca. But before we start, I want to take a moment to thank our amazing sponsors. Um, I want to thank the fine people over at the Circle Care Center. I had my appointment last week. And the very supportive folks over at Progressive Latino Fund. And I also want to send an appreciation um, for you know their effort and, and love and support to um, Mark Adams, who starts class today, and Triumph, uh, Clinton Triumph for helping to shape these spaces as we like start to develop and understand what queer Caribbean programming should look like in their view. So uh, I wanna start also by introducing our moderator, whom uh, many of you also viewers of New England Pride Center should already be familiar with by now. Joelle Simpson, Joelle Earl Simpson is the founder and managing director of SASOG, Guyana. He holds a bachelor's, uh, bachelor's de degree of law from the University of Guyana. He is a Chevening scholar with a master's degree in human rights law from the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom. He is, has over 18 years experience working in gender, human rights and HIV work, including roles such as UNESCO human rights researcher and the HIV education unit and university of uh, unit at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine in uh, Trinidad and human rights associate at the United Nations Development Program in Guyana. Simpson sits on the board of directors of the Guyana Responsible Parenthood Association, or GRPA, and steering committee of the Regional Caribbean Forum for the Liberation and Acceptance of Genders and Sexualities, or CARI flags. Thank you so much for doing this, Joelle. Thank you for bringing your space and your energy into this. And I'm just going to slip out and pretty much allow you to take it away. Go ahead, Joelle. You have the mic. Thanks very much, Mark, and thanks very much to all the folks at New Haven Pride Center for asking me to host this very important conversation on Black Caribbean migration from, from my home in, in Georgetown, Guyana. Um, I want to get straight into introducing our guests so that we could have a lovely conversation and use most of that time, as, as much of that time as possible to have that conversation. So I know that we'll be joined by uh, DJ Ephraim, um, who is coming on screen and joining us from New Haven, um, Connecticut, I imagine. And we'll also be talking with Kishorn, who is Haitian born, I understand, and also be, um, um, not Haitian born, well, you'll tell us, <laughs> and also, um, joining us from the Connecticut area, right? So um, welcome guys, and thank you very much for, um, for talking with me today. Um, I'm gonna ask you both for us to kind of introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your background, especially your connections to the Caribbean. So I'm gonna start with um, the very famous uh, DJ, DJ Ephraim Adams. Oh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you for uh, Joelle's introduction and Max as well and the New Haven Pride Center. I'm actually, I live in Hartford, which is about 40 minutes from New Haven. And uh, my grandfather is from Guyana, of Caribbean uh, heritage. Um, my grandmother is from Alabama, from the southern states of the uh, U.S., uh, then my parents uh, on my father's side, they're from Louisiana. And then my mother is from here in Hartford, Connecticut, where there's this large uh, Caribbean population. 
of uh, Haitians here. Well, uh, African, Caribbean, uh, the entire diaspora. So you have Haitians here, Jamaicans here, Trinidadians here, uh, Guyanese is here, um, and uh, folks of the Latino uh, spectrum as well. So I've been surrounded by a good, uh, decent uh, support system <laughs> and uh, exposed to some culture where you know we have our differences, but we're working on it uh, to come together uh, stronger and better than ever. Fantastic. Thanks for that. And now I'd love to hear from Kishorn. I know you have some Haitian connections, but I don't know exactly what it is. So tell us. So <laughs> my name is Kishorn Henry Walker. Um, my pronouns are he as well as they. Um, and like Ephraim said, thank you so much for that intro. Um, uh, thank you, Max, for the intro and the land acknowledgement as well. Um, I was originally born and raised in St. Thomas, U U.S. Virgin Islands. So I have a very unique um, uh, connection. My, my, my uniqueness um, in terms of the connection to the Caribbean has to do with the fact that I was born American, um, but I do have immigrant parents. Um, so my dad um, is actually from Antigua um, uh, and my mom is from Tortola, British Virgin Islands. And they both went through um, sort of that naturalization process uh, moving over to St. Thomas. So. Um, Growing up uh, in St. Thomas was uh, very similar to um, any other Caribbean island because um, in the summers I used to go um, to visit family in Antigua um, as well as other islands. Um, and I migrated to the United States um, actually when I started college. So I graduated high school, left the islands um, and moved to Baltimore, Maryland um, in 2002. Um, when I started undergrad. Um, so that is, uh, and, and today I would say, I just moved to the West Haven area, um, which is right next to New Haven. So you can say I live in New Haven, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I used to live in Bridgeport and the neighborhood I lived in was very, very Caribbean centric. So at one point, my neighbors on both sides were Jamaican, for instance. Um, uh, my friend that I hung out with two streets over, um, uh, was Haitian. Um, uh, and then I had another friend that was Jamaican in the neighborhood. So it, it is, it, it felt sort of like home, uh, living there as well. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's my connection. I was born and bred. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. So, so folks, we're having this conversation in the context of Black History Month. So I wanted to know, um, for you, Ephraim, and for you, Kishorn, um, especially coming from um, majority Black communities. Um, in your case, Kishon, um, probably predominantly Black community in the Caribbean, um, if I know a little bit about those places that you're from in the region. How important is, is, is Black History Month to, to you? Is it important at all? And, and if so, why? And does it have a particular importance um, to Caribbean people or to you because of your Caribbean heritage? I just wanted to get a sense, a gauge about that. So let's start with DJ. So I could kind of go through a disparity that question reminded me of last year um, with all the police brutality uprisings that was happening here in the States, particularly in Connecticut. I was walking down the street and I just felt very uh, liberated and supporting all the movements that were taking place and being able to speak at different uh, functions and things. So I had wore a, uh, a shirt with the dashiki logo on it um, to express some uh, Afrocentric uh, sense of fashion. And uh, as I was walking down the street, um, someone on the corner had approached me saying that I didn't have the right to uh, wear it because I wasn't uh, born in the motherland. <laughs> and this was uh, someone of, uh, I guess, you, who had migrated here from Africa. And, you know, it had really um, kind of downed me a little bit when you hear those types of things from people who you consider to be uh, someone part of your own community. Mm -hmm. You know, and on my way to the protest, 
I had to kind of remind them. I said, you know, um, we have to kind of end this resentment because no matter where on the uh, diaspora you may be from, um, when the police officer stops us on this street, you're going to be treated like a black man no matter what, you know? Mm-hmm. And here I am marching to a protest, which is supposed to uh, protect all of us in, you know, in the eyes of lawmaking and, and, and the judicial system and things like that. And sure enough, when I returned back from the uh, protest, he was standing in front of, a, um, I, I hate the stereotype, but in front of a liquor store, you know, minding his business and he wasn't doing anything. And a police officer had stopped him on a check to ask where he was going, you know, and because I live on this street, I was able to um, kind of walk in the vicinity of the officer and say, no, you know, I know him and he's not doing anything. I live right here across the street and it's not anything drug related or whatnot. Um, but from then on, I didn't really, I didn't really um, say anything else about it, but it just really um, expresses to me the importance of instead of uh, focusing so much on our differences sometimes, um, it is good to kind of bring people back to the narrative that, um, you know, it's our similarities that are probably going to get us out of this in the end. So um, that's why that. Black history is important to teach all types of uh, history. Caribbean history is Black history. American history is Black history. African history is, is Black history. You know, it's all Black history if you're Black. <laughs> right. What about you, Kishan? Yeah, um, I would say growing up um, in the Caribbean, I, I, I sort of feel we were very um, active around these things like Black history and, and, and Caribbean history and even Virgin Islands history. Um, uh, I'll tell you a quick story in a second, but um, I almost feel, and this is going to sound heavier than it really is, but I almost feel like we took Black history a bit for granted um, because Black history in the Caribbean versus Black history living in the United States showed up very differently, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Black history in the Caribbean was very much um, celebratory. This is who we are and this is who we continue to be and we continue to press on um, as a Caribbean uh, people, right? Um, As opposed to in the United States, and this has been my experience, Black history is a a lot more um, really fighting for our space. (laughs) <laughs> right um and 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 fighting for what we truly who we truly are and fighting for um uh, essentially others to make space for for us um to exist in the world right um when we talk when we think about what you shared um djf from adams about you know black lives matter and things like that that that's the reason why we have black history so i would say it shows up um pretty differently for me. And, and so I've had to shift my perspective over time um, to really recognize the real, the reality that we're in um, living on the, the, the U.S. mainland. Um, uh, funny story, uh, real quick, um, Efren, when you shared that um, story about the, the, the Shiki print, um, I remember starting college and going to um, a Caribbean student association meeting um, and and it was like our orientation, and I was so excited to meet other people from the Caribbean and fellowship, and you know, hopefully make friends because I'm in a new place. I don't know anybody, all of that, right? And I stepped into the meeting, and the um, the, the the host was there and was asking everyone to introduce themselves, and I introduced myself, and I told him where I was from, and he said, "You don't belong here," <laughs> and I was like. Uh, <laughs> and 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 the re- and I understand why he said it. He said you don't belong here um, because like you're from uh, a, a U.S. territory, and so I literally left the meeting like feeling so embarrassed because I had stepped into a. I'm from the Caribbean. I'm a Caribbean student. I would think that like this is a space that I belong into. So that that in and of itself really shaped um sort of some of my experiences 
Um, and really making sure that people know and understand no matter what your experience is, no matter what your intersectionality, no matter um, whether you're from the greater Antilles, yet lesser Antilles, um, if your, your island is um, uh, uh, British, French, Dutch, whatever, right? You're still Black, you're still Caribbean, and I think that's important. Um, when I went to high school, um, we, we had um, a requirement to take Caribbean history as, um, as a class. We had a requirement to take Virgin Islands history as a class. So there's a lot of like pride I have around a lot of those early stories as well. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, and in your experiences, guys, as um, people of Caribbean heritage, Black people of Caribbean heritage, in, in in the New Haven, Connecticut area, um, especially. Um, and I know you're relatively new to the neighborhood, so to speak, Kishan. Um, do you, what what do you think about um, the inclusion of um, queer Caribbean people, LGBTQ Caribbean people, um, in the Black community? Um, do you guy do you yourselves feel included um and you know your peers um you might also be able to share about experiences of your peers or experiences that you know about um what's the state of inclusion like in your in your views so i can start this one off um so just just for for context joel um this is my second time living in this town so i'm pretty familiar okay. um and even the town i lived in prior i'm pretty familiar there because i was and it's just 20 minutes down the road um <laughs> but uh to answer your question directly do i feel included no um uh i don't think i've ever like i a lot of time i have this um there's a lot of spaces that i don't necessarily feel included in and so over time and over the years, I have built up this, uh, I really don't care. I'm going to show up anyway, <laughs> because this is a space that I belong, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have built up that, 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 that armor of, this is not for you to dictate where I belong. Right. I diagnose that I belong in this space and I'm going to show up there. And as a matter of fact, um, if you don't have a seat for me at the table, I don't need a seat because I grew up very poor. I would sit on the floor, but I was you would still hear my voice, right? <laughs> and so and so I I a lot of times I just rise above really the noise of whether I feel included or not, because if if I if I retreat back to that space of whether I am included, um it essentially uh starves me and others that may come after me of some type of inclusive experience. And so I want to make sure that whether I'm a trailblazer or not, people see me and people like me in spaces like that. Um, and that's important to me overall. Like that, that is, that is truly who I am to my core. And you don't have to tell me I, whether I belong there or not. I'm going to show up. Yeah, I love it. I love it. How about you, DJ? Um, well, you know, I've been here for a while. And when I look at immigration, you know, when you first arrive, you may not know of places that you can go or where you may feel included and that information may not be as accessible to certain people depending on disparities or who they know or in their networking circle. Um, so, I mean, of course, at times I've felt like I'm not, haven't been included, but because of who I am now and I'm DJ Ephraim and who I, you know, I strive to be the best I can be. I, you know, for me, it's about because I didn't necessarily have those spaces. So now that I'm a promoter and an event planner and a DJ, and I'm more connected to folks like you, Joel, and the Pride Center and performers and different artists and music and engagement and things, I try to host things 
where hopefully other people can come and, and be welcomed and feel welcomed and have a hug or have a drink or air out their problems or do art or whatnot. So um, I try to uh, put a little bit more responsibility on myself to kind of be the change that, you know, I want to see in the future. And um, when I look at, uh, as Koshorn said, uh, Kishorn shows up and and and, be, and beats Kishorn, you know. And there's been some times where you know maybe I'm not feeling my most best self or feeling included, and I show up to an event and I see Kishorn, and now I say, oh well, now I know I'm supposed to be here too because I see <laughs> the uh, the representation and the visibility of someone else if I you know hadn't had gone, you know what I mean? So. <sighs> I don't know. There's so much power and visibility and those types of things. So I just try to be as visible as possible in my own regard. But for me, it's, it's definitely about using the resources that I've um, developed and hold and how can I uh, provide a platform for others at this point. You're on mute, Joel. <laughs> yeah, I have to remember to unmute. Um, I was wondering if the experience of migration, especially relatively recent migration, when you're new, when you're an asylum seeker, um, you know, um, how does that, how does that complicate, um, being in that space? How does that complicate, um, showing up as Caribbean and queer? Um, in Black America, so to speak, how does that complicate showing up um, in America, in America, um, not just Black America, but in America, in spaces of, of mixed races, um, for people of 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 those complexities? Kishan? Yeah. Oh, you want to start, DJ? Yeah, I'll take that one quickly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, here in the north end of Hartford, it's a very uh, prosperous area as far as like, well, there's more Caribbean owned businesses here than maybe in some other parts of the state and the country, um, for one. So um, when I kind of look at that, you know, in America in general, and I think also when you travel other places as well, when Americans travel to other places, um, people assume that uh, a lot of folks coming from the Caribbean, especially uh, maybe looking to do business startups or start uh, businesses, probably already have a savings, already have some money that they've accumulated to uh, come here and uh try to provide a future for themselves. So I think um, people get wind of that and think that somehow life for Caribbean folk is going to be uh, easier or better, but I don't think that's necessarily true. There's also the stigma of, you know, as I told the gentleman in my story, that when you come here, you're going to be uh, Instant, treat it institutionally the same way pretty much across the board based on the um, color of your, your pigmentation of your skin or whatnot. So I think there's some, um, maybe some stereotypes and some falsehoods that need to be kind of balanced out there and set the record straight um, for folks who may not uh, know that or have assumptions. You wanna to add to that, Kishan? Yeah. Um, when you talked about asylum seekers, um, I, I I thought about, um, and oftentimes I think about this, right? I I thought about how much privilege, even in that space, I have, right? Um, and when I talk about showing up, you know, having a seat at, t at the table, et cetera, um, the, the reason why I take a lot of pride in that is because, again, there are other people that have a voice that cannot necessarily speak up because there are all these things hanging over their head, right? Migrated here, um, don't know the way of life here, or or is like 
seeking asylum here, et cetera, et cetera. There's all those things, right? Layered on top of it. And so there, that normally comes with um, a level of fear, hesitation, whatever, whatever, you know, uh, the, that adjective is. And I think that's where um, I, I take a lot of pride in the way that I show up to help my, um, uh, you know, Caribbean brothers, sisters, um, and non-binary folks um, uh, to really ensure that people are educated around who we are, educated around how we show up, um, and, and ensure that spaces are created for us ultimately. Fantastic. I agree with you completely. And I mean, this Caribbean series that the New Haven Pride Center is putting on, I think is um, a very important initiative to kind of raise the level of awareness about these issues and to confront these issues and <clears throat> address the challenges. But I'm also wondering from your perspectives, what else can community organizations um, like the New Haven Pride Center and other organizations working in the LGBTQ space in the Connecticut area, um, working on issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion, what else can organizations do um, to welcome um, Black queer migrants um, in the state, help them feel included, help them to settle in? What are some of the things from your perspective um, that, um, that we all should be doing as community organizers? So I'll, I'll start this one off. Um, like this talk, I mean, this in and of itself really helps to shed light <laughs> on us and who we are and how we show up, all of that, right? Um, but even when I think about some nuances around um, Caribbean people, um, we may not be necessarily well-versed in LGBTQ culture, especially here in the United States, in, especially in like progressive spaces, right? And I've seen so many times where like someone that may not know a lot is just seeking information and just gets shot down or canceled or just like ridiculed simply because like I'm from the Caribbean. I grew up this way. I know my lifestyle as this term and they use it, right? But it's triggering for someone else. Um, and I love the term like assume positive intent because I like I don't know <laughs> any better, and um, so at work I'm uh, I'm also in the um, LGBTQ space there, um, not working but like in our um, employee resource group. And I remember someone joining the call and was like, um, I, "I am so afraid to offend people on this call. I have so many questions." And I and 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 I think creating a safe space is so important for all of us, no matter what walk of life that we are. But as long as we can assume that positive intent and we can educate each other, um, it really helped for us to uh, continue to drive, you know, who we are, continue to to move forward and continue to educate each other just based on our pure experiences. So I think that's one big thing. Another thing that community centers, you know, let me tell you, like, I love a good fat. I just, I need some more fatting, please. Somewhere around here in Connecticut. I need a good fat. DJ Afrim, I'm going to send you all my favorite songs, but I need a fat. Thank you. <laughs> Especially after the last two years, right? Right, uh, listen. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, you, I learned something new there, Kishan assume positive intent and, and i love that and yeah I, I was having this conversation quite recently as well um, with one of my colleagues that sometimes people don't always use the right terminology um, when referring to us and so on and it's a lot of times because they don't know better and you know um and we give people a hard time as opposed to using some of those moments um to teach and to educate uh, and to help people learn dj you had thoughts on that as well Um, I was debating this with a lot of uh, what I'm going through. Uh, 
you know, being gay or friends that may be trans and lesbians and the whole spectrum. And, um, I think what we could do more is highlighting um, stories of positivity and try not to dwell too much on the victimization aspects of LGBTQ or, or Black uh, types of heritage, you know, because um, I think, you know, there's been times where <laughs> I walk into a space, right? And folks are like, well, what are you doing here? We don't need you here because you're you're well off or you're you're doing uh, better for yourself. And for for all they know, maybe I'm not. Maybe there's something in the home that they're not aware of, you know? But I think that a lot of times organizations feel like if there's kind of like no need to kind of cling to the to the victimization part of your identity, then it doesn't necessarily uh, hope in their platform. I don't know if I'm kind of saying that in the correct way. But um, I, I, long story short, I want to see us being less poster children for, for trauma and, and bad things and doing more stories that highlight the success of a trans woman who found a job and a husband and she's married and she's doing happily great. I think we need more visibility of things like that to kind of break the mold, you know, and the same for gay men and, 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 and whatnot. So I think that would do a lot better for um, humanizing us, um, not just always showing us in pain and the damsel in distress and, you know, um, being terrified. And while yes, those things do unfortunately happen, it's not the story that everyone goes through. I, Ephraim, I love that. Um, and while I was sitting here, I wondered to myself, because we hear a lot of like bad stories about people from the Caribbean, how they were treated when they came out, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know if this is the case. This is a whole other talk, uh, but I just want to plant this seed and say, I wonder if there is some sort of relationship between um, sort of the adversity that we've experienced and sort of the, the fetishization that happens to us <laughs> in life. If, if, if you know what I mean, like, I wonder if there's a relationship there, but that's, that's just my curious mind. <laughs> I hear that, I hear that. Um, I'm also wondering guys about um, service providers um, in the state. Um, about the level, um, the level of cultural competence there and cultural sensitivity, do you, do you, in your experiences, pe feel like uh, healthcare workers, social workers in Connecticut, um, the tri-state area, even um, understand um, enough about queer Caribbean people and are sensitized enough to? deliver services which are culturally appropriate for our needs um, is that sensitivity there in 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 the in the new haven area in in the state in general dj seems excited to answer that question i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead and start off <laughs> well, in a moment you guys are going to join me on my walk to the bus stop as i'm in this zoom just because i'm going to be going back to work soon as well but um <laughs> there's definitely a lack of like resources specifically dedicated to LGBTQ plus Caribbean folk. Now, I mean, of course, places like the New Haven Pride Center, and I can list a bunch of others, um, they do their best jobs to fill a void on what may be lacking. But, you know, one organization can't hold down an entire community or demographic of people, you know? Um, all that you can really do is suggest that bring in more volunteers if you can from that community or, um, you know, diversify the hiring pro the process so long as they qualify, of course, as well. Um, and I would probably say do fundraisers. And then you have this also kind of added uh, 
pressure of the, you know, the general uh, clinics and organizations in, in different places who want to help, but they've never, um, it's almost like the people who they provide services to are, are like helping them learn about the <laughs> queer Caribbean aspects of themselves. And then that data is taken so that they can try to uh, use it to the best of their ability, you know? So it's just, it, that, 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 that is a uh, hard process that we're working on out here. Um, I would say that healthcare is the one area, especially in Connecticut, that scares me the most. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I know that we have a ways to go in terms of representation in healthcare. I know we have a ways to go in terms of like just education around our, um, you know, our identities um, in healthcare. Um, but even more so, like I, I had a personal experience where um, it wasn't until maybe her third eye doctor, my mom really got a solid answer around why her, um, uh, you know, her the condition um, that she has with her eyes, um, why it was so bad. Um, and we didn't know until we saw this particular, um, you know, eye doctor. He said, well, listen, let me tell you, like, Black women are this time as uh, is likely to catch this, right? But you're from the Caribbean, and here, and this doctor was so so like knowledgeable around this. But it wasn't until we got to our third doctor that we really learned a lot of what was going on with my mom. So that, in and of itself, really jolted me uh, big time. And I and and I often wonder to myself, like, how can we continue to push a lot? Um, of like diversity, inclusion, like a lot of that work. And when I say DNI, I'm not talking about, you know, having a cookout and inviting people of every color. I'm talking about having very impactful and uncomfortable conversations around who we truly are as people, um, what affects us, what are some of those environmental things that um, may uh, play into um, our health. Um, uh, and, and, and the people that can really care for us and the people that can care for us in a way where they're not judging who we are. You see a black person, you automatically say, uh, they don't have no money, <laughs> right? Or, or whatever those stereotypes may be. Um, but I will tell you that that kind of jolts me a little bit, but I selfishly, I will say when I do go to those medical centers, that may have people that either look like me, or you can tell like it's someone of Latinx heritage that may be from the Caribbean as well. I'm like, oh, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that feeling like the anxiety is, um, some, some anxiety is lifted off your shoulders. Mm -hmm. But I have a specific question from one of our audience uh, members. And then I have a follow up uh, broader questions. Um, someone is asking if you guys who are in Connecticut would be willing to come and speak at their um, MA in counseling program at Fairfield University about some of these issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion of Black, queer, Caribbean people in the state. That's one. And I'm also wondering about, because um, both of you are involved in community organizing and community engagement in different ways. Um, I think this is a very, very interesting model that the New Haven Pride Center has. We're talking about um, queer Caribbean migration, Black queer Caribbean migration, um, primarily in the US context. And I'm here hosting this program um, as a non-migrant um, from the Caribbean, from Georgetown, Guyana. Um, so I'm really seeing on their part, and. Uh, uh, a deliberate, a, debil a deliberate attempt, a deliberate strategy to be inclusive and, and, and to reach across the ocean, so to speak, and engage with stakeholders who are still in the region um, on, on these issues. So I'm wondering from your perspectives, 
um, about the level of engagement and solidarity with um, organizers in the Caribbean, groups in the Caribbean, um, to kind of work on these issues together, together, because a lot of these issues are transnational, right? Mm -hmm. In many ways, um, understanding the situation for for migrants and asylum seekers requires an understanding of what's going on in the Caribbean as well, right? Um, so I'm wondering what you think about the level of engagement and, and solidarity um, and solidarity between um, Caribbean organizers and groups who are still in the region um, with folks like you and others um, who are in the diaspora, so to speak. Um, and Kishan, you want to take that first? Well, hopefully Ephraim gets a little settled and we can see yeah. a stable. <laughs> <laughs> He's showing up the Caribbean Resource Center. I love that. <laughs> Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm happy to. So to answer the the um, the viewer's question first, um, uh, I I used to live in. Well, I just moved from Bridgeport. Fairfield University isn't far. I'm happy to. Um, the the good thing about the 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 group in counseling is um, I work in the the human resource space, which is very similar to counseling. So. I'm happy to to have some conversation there um, as well because I have a very um, I have a lot of passion for um, the profession that they're studying. So, thank you for that. Um, and then my thoughts um, around. So I will tell you, a lot of these organizations, groups, etc., that exist, uh, especially in the Caribbean. Um, I'm not very knowledgeable of them. And I wish I was, right? Um, so even this talk and like hearing your um, bio and learning about some of the spaces in which you occupy and do a lot of this work is really inspiring um, to me. It says to me that the Caribbean is trying to move forward in a very, in, in a way that it's very progressive and starts to create space for people um, because believe it or not, like homophobia still like sort of reigns supreme in the Caribbean, right? So we, we have to we, we have to truly um, get it from that the source, right? To really understand the climate of the Caribbean and the people that eventually would migrate to the United States because that's inevitable. It always happens, right? So I, I, I truly, thank the New Haven Pride Center for this um, connection um, in the Caribbean, because I think it is truly needed. And it's truly needed for us to, again, move us as a people forward to create space in the United States. Gotcha. Uh, DJ, are you in a position to, to respond to both, both to those questions? So as you can see, I just had passed the uh, Caribbean Resource uh, Center, which is right across the street from my home. Um, and, and even they have, you know, needed a lot of assistance as far as doing outreach and reaching the community that they uh, serve. Now they're not necessarily. Uh, uh, their target is not necessarily LGBTQ plus, you know, so a lot of more of the work would have to be other organizations partnering with a, um, a resource center like that. Um, also passing urbanly uh, right now, which if those organizations partnered together, you would be reaching the with predominantly Black um, African American community. Um, where I would fit in is usually something I would do the traditional uh, walk down the street, not from door to door, and do my best to try and get everyone together and on the same page. But I think that can only uh, work to so much magnitude. Um, luckily, times have changed, and I can really only speak for Hartford. Um, when we had an intersectional Juneteenth event for folks from the Caribbean, uh, African-Americans, and uh, queer see. folks all got together and had like an intersectional acknowledgement of Juneteenth and things like that, um, which, like I said, basically reverts back to Black History Month. Um, how can we really uh, nail this down in a way that uh, 
we can kind of find some of our similarities, um, acknowledge our differences, and then build out of that in a sense that's going to uh, help everyone, you know, and, uh, you know, I guess in a more uh, uh, spectrumized uh, diaspora level. Fantastic. Thanks for that. And I'm going to ask our, um, our viewer, I think his name is Kane, if I remember correctly, or Blaine, <laughs> I don't remember, um, to get in touch with the New Haven Pride Center. So um, the center can facilitate um, contact with Kishorn about engagement. You can contact Max at latinx at newhavenpridecenter.org. And I'm sure Max will be happy to facilitate um, um, the connection with Kishorn to so you could participate in that um in that student group on counseling. So thanks for that. Um we just got about um just less than 10 minutes and um I think we're having a very interesting conversation so far but um as an organization as an organizer I'm always thinking about what happens next. You know how do we take um conversation to the next level. Um so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on what more all of us as stakeholders can do to have Black Caribbean queer people, Black Caribbean queer migrants um, feel more included in the, in the US spaces in which they, they dwell, in which they live, in which they work. Um, and, you know, uh, a wholesome sense of inclusion, um, included in the Caribbean diaspora, um, in, 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 in those, in those areas, in those states, in those communities, included in the black community, included in the LGBTQ community, um, across the board. Um, what more can we do, um, for inclusion for black queer Caribbean migrants in particular? I can take this one first. Um, I will tell you, uh, Joel. I earlier I mentioned that like there's a lot of spaces that I don't feel included in. Um, I will be very honest in saying Caribbean spaces is a big one, um, and I think that it, it, there could be. I mean, there are very, very many reasons to that, known and unknown, right? Um, but it's it, it it is a space that I struggle a lot in um and the reason for that is due to like i had a very very dark upbringing right so um just to be clear there i think that as caribbean people we can continue to be brave around our own people and you know educate as much as possible um i have family that don't to this day still don't necessarily know and understand my um, lifestyle. I mean, I'm out and you can take it or leave it. Like I'm out, right? But they don't understand it. Um, and and so because they don't understand it, it comes with some, a lot of, not some, a lot of negativity towards it. It comes with a lot of um, uh, assuming stereotypes. Like, you know, as many people in um, Connecticut know, I perform as Sparkle A Diamond. I'm a drag queen, right? Um, but I, I have some family members that has gone and um, spread rumors saying that I had a sex change operation. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like, it's the weirdest, you know, in, in my eyes, but to them, right, uh, when you're dressed as a woman, you are a woman. I, so I, I guess, but that's, that's exactly the space in which I would love to see more work done. Um, because we have, we, we have a ways to go in terms of like educating our own people, um, in the way that we want to show up and, and, and courage is part of that suit. Fantastic. DJ Ephraim, your thoughts as we wrap up. Where do we go from here? What do, what can we do next? You have to unmute DJ. <laughs> um, so you, 
that question got me thinking about um you just turn off the the uh thank you, I'm finally off the bus. Um <laughs> what can we do to improve for the Caribbean? Uh economics, right? So as I'm coming down Albany, uh it reminded me of the Jamaican Day Parade, which we have had here for the past like twenty years down in Hartford. Um and the route of the Jamaican Day Parade has always run through the Caribbean part of town, which is essentially um, North Main Street, where you see these buses heading towards. And the route goes down the street and it ends at the, uh, at the West Indian Club, okay? And it's been this way for years. Why? Because all the Caribbean owned businesses are on that street. The parade flourishes and our own community benefits from the parade being in our section of the town. As of maybe three years ago, the city of Hartford has recommended that we have the parade route chain and circle through Main Street of the inner city at a park called Bushnell Park. Now, on the surface, this might seem great, like, ooh, uh, more exposure, we want to integrate this into the rest of the city, but I told them don't do that because now what happens, all the white owned businesses will benefit and profit more so than keeping it in our own backyard. And people didn't really necessarily understand that. Either. So that's my take on that. What can we do? Keep the money flow going where it needs to be. All right. And how can you get equity? How can you uh, save funds? How can you, you know, continue to own your own businesses and flourish? Well, they don't want us to do that. That's why they want us to move the parade down to the inner city where, you know, the little up and down goes. They're not going to turn up like we turn up. They're not going to blast music how we like to party. They're not going to eat the good flavorful food how That's we like to do it. They're not going to dance and you know, all those things. So that's that's what I'm working on out here in Hartford over here. <laughs> I I have to agree with you, uh, Ephraim, because like when it's in your own neighborhood, the turn up is real. <laughs> when it's outside of it, it feels kind of eh. <laughs> forced. But also a very important economic argument because um, what I know about parades and I know a thing or two about parades um, <laughs> since we organize our own gay pride parade here, um, the wow. route is also important for livelihoods on, on, on parade day that, you know, the route is where people will buy drinks and buy food and people will congregate along the route to get a, a glimpse of the parade. So um, you need to have that where the Caribbean businesses are because it's a, uh, it's a Jamaican day parade and, you know, Jamaica's part of the Caribbean. So mm -hmm. um, I agree with that um, completely. Um, DJ Ephraim. Kishon and Ephraim, I want to thank you both for um, having this conversation with me for the past hour. Of course, the time is never enough, to, <laughs> but all good things must come to an end. Um, I've really um, enjoyed listening to your perspectives um, because while I, I, I visit um, the U.S. pretty often, um, at least once a year prior to the pandemic. Um, Connecticut, I've, I've never been to the state of Connecticut and I'm going to change that this year. Um, and um, it's really interesting to hear about experiences outside of the really big cities and the really big states like New York and so on, um, where, where there's a Caribbean presence as well. I also want to thank um, Patrick Don and Max from the New Haven Pride Center for having me facilitate this conversation all the way from Georgetown, Guyana, and for really involving me in the Caribbean programming um, this year. Um, we started with one conversation last month, and I look forward to building a stronger relationship and a partnership um, between Sasa Guyana and the New Haven Pride Center um, as we continue to work together throughout um, 2022. I'm just gonna hand it back over to Max to tell our viewers what they can expect next from the New Haven Pride Center. So Max, over to you. This is, has been a lot of firsts and it's really exciting to be a part of, even my little, little grain. And we get 
in one conversation, we get an invitation live, you know, to, <laughs> to speak at Fairfield University. I also got an email during the conversation from the daily, uh, the Yale Daily News. They want another interview to talk about these series of conversations. And we also got a tour of, of Hartford, <laughs> thanks to our dear DJ. So this has been, clearly there is a space to discover about this community here. And it's just so awesome to be able to like, look what happens when you build it, people will come. And it's just been so phenomenal to like share these experiences with y'all. You know, to write it out in my own way and just like be my, you know, be be distant and also watch the magic happen. So thank you so much, Joel, for for you know for for helping to put this together. You know, there have been some changes here in the last minute, but we adjusted and and we still made it happen. So thank you so much, Kishorn, also um, for for like dedicating this time. Like you know, we you, we had a very impactful conversation, which touched me personally, which helped me grow and understand a little bit more about my space in this. So I'm growing with y'all. It's amazing to see. And clearly there has been, like Kishorn said it best, that there are uncomfortable conversations that need to happen that will help us all grow in our own space. And I'd like to think that this could be the start of that or this could help understand or envision how we can get there. So thank you all so much. The DJ left us, but I'm sure he's on the streets of, of uh, <laughs> there he is. There he's back. <laughs> there he is, bringing, bringing us the streets, you know, the energy of the streets into the, you know, into the space. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for being part of this. DJ, thank you so much. Um, Patrick, you know, the energy in the back, the sponsors. There's going to be more coming for coming, you know, coming through. Um, as as it was mentioned, Black History Month is something we'll be focusing on and all the intersectionalities that you'll find in there with queer experiences. But also remember women's programming in March for International Women's Month and something that we also want to think about, maybe even stretch this queer Caribbean programming into March as well and start thinking about queer women, um, queer women experiences, which also can be very valuable. So I just want to thank everyone again. I can't thank you enough. Please stay tuned for more programming from Guyana to Hartford <laughs> to Norwalk, Connecticut. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And we look forward to seeing you more into the future. Thank you again.